today? Yes, I am. And is the location from where you are uh, teleconferencing from ADA accessible and open to the public? Yes, it is. And if a member of the public would like to be heard from that location, could they be heard fr uh, by us? And have you posted the agenda at a location that can be publicly seen from the place that you are teleconferencing from? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Vice Chair Votto has been qualified to participate uh, via teleconferencing under the traditional Brown Act rules. Thanks. Uh, you okay, may now take roll call. Yeah, if everyone's present, I will begin the roll call. David Kwan. Here. Dick Santos. Yes. Andrew. Here. Ezwar. Present. Dave. Here. Howard. Present. Sunita. Present. And I, Vice Chair Frank Lovato, am present. And I note for the record, uh, Chair Lanza is absent. Thank you, Mayor Tapp. So, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Me just a second for orders of the day. Okay, for our orders of the day, we have the October 10th Disability Committee meeting has been canceled. The next Disability Committee meeting will be November 6th. We're also adding some late agenda items. Uh, Board members, we have received information related to two items that came to our attention after the agenda for the meeting was posted, and we need to take immediate action. First item involves the performance evaluation of the investment staff, and we need a motion for the board to add a performance evaluation agenda item for the CIO position. Because this involves a performance evaluation, it will be held in closed session. The motion will need to be passed by two thirds vote <coughs> for us to proceed to add this <coughs> closed session item, can I entertain a motion? So moved. Santos. Motion, Dick? Second, Wilson. Who is this? Second, Wilson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, David. Yes. Dick. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Eswar. Aye. Dave. Aye. Howard. Yes. <clears throat> Sunita. Yes. And I chair Votto am a yes. We have a second item. This item is to the edge add to the agenda item. Uh, discussion and action to amend our contract <coughs> with our external auditors, MGO, to include an agreed upon procedure, engagement to audit the inclusion of invoice management fees in the plans investments. Performance for the fees not to exceed 25000 for work under the amendment. The motion will need to pass by two-thirds votes for us to proceed to add this closed session item. Can I entertain a motion? That so would be an, um, bef before there's a motion, that that item would be added to the new business in the public section of the uh, agenda. Thank you, Mayor Santos agrees. Second, Gardiner. <laughs> Any further discussion? Okay, call for the vote. David. Yes. Dick. Yes. Andrew. Aye. Eswar. Aye. Dave. Aye. Howard. Yes. Sunita. Aye. Aye, Vice Chair Votto, I mean, aye. I mean, with that, this concludes uh, our open session. We'll be heading into closed session. is not here. I thought I saw him. Recording stopped.
Maytech, if we have a quorum, I guess we can start. Uh, yeah, we could. Recording in progress. You're up, Franco. Okay. This is uh, the chair. We have one reportable item from closed session. The board has voted to retain conflict counsel in an employee matter. Can you please report out the vote? Uh, as far as the number or unanimous? Uh, if it was unanimous, you can state it's unanimous. It was unanimous. Okay, thank you. And one other thing, I am unfortunately gonna have to step away from this meeting. So I ask that you guys would be able to elect a temporary chair to run the rest of the meeting. So is there a motion to nominate uh, any of the remaining trustees yes, to serve Ex Santos, as the I nominate Andrew Gardner to be uh, acting chair at this time. So I got a first by Santos. I'll second that. And then any discussion? Okay, David? Yes. Dick? Yes. Andrew? Uh, he stepped away from the mic. Uh, maybe come okay. back to him. Uh, Eswar? Aye. Dave? Aye. Howard? Yes. Sunita? Yes. And I, Franco, am an I, assuming that Andrew actually accepts, which I think he will. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. And I will see you next time. Thank you for stepping in, Franco. Appreciate it. And uh, Trustee Gardner, do you accept? Uh, yes, sir. Um, also, uh, just to um, get a couple, of, a couple other things to report out for actually from closed session. Um, one is, as um, Franco was saying, um, the board has uh, retained um, Russ for um, uh, conflict council. Um, we did uh, create a budget for for that um, of. of uh, $10,000, which will be split evenly between um, us and Federated, so $5,000 each. Uh, we have also uh, made a, created a budget um, uh, for a, a personnel matter, um, which would also be $12,500 um, um, as for our split uh, along with uh, Federated, which has approved also the exact same amount for a total of 25000 we have also select uh, Franco um, to be our chair liaison um, with our conflict council between police and fire board and conflict council. So to move on, uh, we're gonna go ahead to the consent calendar. Is there anything on the consent calendar that would like to be pulled? If not, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. I got a motion by Dick, second by Wilson. Um, any comments? If not, we'll uh, take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any disagree? All right, that motion passed. Going on to. Oh, before you move on, yes. there's the public and retiree comments. Okay. Uh, do we have any um, public or retiree uh, comments? If not, then we'll go ahead and move on to uh, two investments um, to our CIO Prabhu Pilani. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we have two agenda items. Uh, the first is IPS revisions. This was discussed at the investment committee at the last investment committee meeting and recommend uh, and was approved for discussion at the board, which will be led by Jay. And following that, we have a comprehensive fee report that we present to both boards uh, every October and then we take it to the city council in November. So for item 2B, I'll turn this over to Jay and I believe Eileen from Veris is on the line as well. Eileen, 
Sorry, one second. Let me get the uh, attachment up. All right, I think we're going to start with Eileen from Veris. Thank you, Jay, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think you were on the right page, page eight. Uh, I, what, what we're going to do is just quickly go through um, changes to the investment policy statement that were approved at the investment committee meeting. And the first has to do with the um, asset allocation process in terms of uh, evaluation versus uh, monitoring uh, and, and, and clarifying the language around those two. Uh, so on, on page eight, as you can see here, um, above the asset allocation tools and methods, um, we, we simply eliminated text that assigns specific numbers um, uh, because those were based on point in time and, and were actually dated from a few years ago and that language is really not necessary given the first sentence in each of those three areas. So um, under asset allocation tools and methods A, um, we um, are, are essentially clarifying that the um, current process for evaluating the um, policy, the formal asset allocation policy as it relates to the least cost policy portfolio and the strategic asset allocation policy um, will be conducted, have, should be conducted every three years, has been conducted every three years, but also can be conducted on an ad hoc basis if requested by either staff and or board or when a significant market correction occurs. So, so that process is where policy alternatives are considered and there's a fair amount of analysis done by both consultant and staff to determine whether or not a new a formal asset allocation policy should be adopted. Uh, a language was added to, again, clarify that on an annual basis, the least cost portfolio policy and the strategic asset allocation policies will be re reviewed annually in order to um, be able to understand how those policies look today or at this point in time given the consultants um, capital market assumptions, which we always update annually. It's common practice in the industry for investment consultants, that even, even though our asset allocation assumptions uh, with respect to capital market expected returns and risk are for a long time horizon, 10 years plus. Um, the fact of the matter is we always update our assumptions every year based upon information from the markets because these are forecasts. And it is also industry best practices for plan sponsors such as yourselves to simply review the current policies, in this case, the least cost um, policy portfolio and the strategic asset allocation policy in light of those updated assumptions, but the expectation is that no changes or decisions are made as a result of that. So it's simply to clarify, you, you do employ a three-year um, deep dive into evaluating the policy or on an ad hoc basis, but annually you'll uh, review and be cognizant of or be made aware of how those policies look in the current market environment, just simply to understand that. And in terms of additional changes, we don't, um, all, all we did was eliminate Appendix C, um, which had to do with um, operating guidelines, if you will, which really no longer apply given the current governance of the board and staff. Um, and now, if, is, does anyone have any questions before I turn it over to Jay to cover the remaining changes? Okay, we'll turn to the rest of the changes. Thank you. 
So uh, the, the bulk of the rest of the changes fall under the manager selection process. And here we're, we're largely just cleaning up language that reflects uh, the current due diligence process. So the, the existing IPS uh, had, had mentions of an RFP, RFI uh, used in manager selection, and that's not really the case and hasn't been since um, uh, we, we reached the point where uh, staff has uh, investment manager selection uh, delegated authority. And so all we're doing in bullet point one is we're clearing up some of the language and we're um, kind of clarifying the, uh, the, the quiet period policy. And the quiet period is the, the, the concept is that uh, when there's a manager uh, being considered for inclusion in the portfolio, there shouldn't be any kind of uh, any contact between the said manager and someone who could influence staff in the selection of that strategy. And so different board or different plans will institute a quiet policy in different ways. You might see an email blast out or saying, please don't talk to this manager or, or so on. Uh, here we've decided to impl uh, implement that in kind of what we think is the most efficient way where we're, we're telling the manager not to get in touch with, uh, say, any of the trustees or non-investment staff. Um, and we're, we're asking them to verify that uh, as, as part of the due diligence and selection process. And so that's, that's largely uh, bullet point one. We eliminated bullet point four. Uh, if you read through bullet point four, it, it, it's largely, it, it, well, it's exactly duplicative of bullet point three, um, but just clarifying for, uh, in the case of private markets, we decided we might as well just uh, clear out number four and let three speak for uh, all of the asset classes. Yeah, and finally, um, we just wanted to, again, get practice in line with policy here, or policy in line with practice. We give the investment committee, so investment staff provides the investment committee uh, semi-annually a list of all of the active manager transactions and um, we just wanted to put that point into policy. That's, that's really the meat of, uh, of the changes here. Are, are there any questions? We did, we did run this all through the investment committee. Any comments, questions? If you do need approval. Yeah. If none, uh, I'll take a motion for approval. So, okay, second. All right, uh, motion um, by Dick, second by Eshwar. Uh, any public comment? If none, um, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Yes. Any opposed? All right, that's 4B passes. Um, sorry, not 4B, sorry, 2B. Um, we're gonna go ahead and then jump to uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, let's go ahead and jump to 2C, uh, presentation of investment fee report for calendar year 2022 by investment staff. All right, oh. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. As do, you, do you mind uh, if I just quickly, yeah. um, I, I yeah. noticed that we forgot to wave sunshine in a number of items, and yeah. before we can proceed, do you mind if we oh, wave not sunshine? Not at all. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I apologize for that. Uh, we do got to wave sunshine for items um, 2C1, which is the police and fire annual fee report 2022 attachment. Um, item 2C2, the fee presentation, police and fire 2022 attachment, and then also item 4D, 2023 economic assumption review attachment. Okay. Motion to wait, Sunshine? Correct. Yeah. So moved. Motion by Santos. Second. Second by Wilson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. All right, thank you. Sorry about sure. that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, 2C, as I mentioned before, this is a comprehensive expense report. It's more than investment fees that we present to the boards uh, every year and then take it to the city council. And I am told that we are only a handful of retirement systems in the state of California that provide this comprehensive and expense uh, report. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Eric, Dinesh, and Jay uh, to present this. It's uh, Eric's first time before the police and fire board, so please be nice to him. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. <coughs> um, so there should be two documents that are attached uh, that you have received. Um, one of them is a in-depth fee report uh, with um, verbiage, and then the other one is a 
is uh, what we'll be focusing on today, which is the presentation, the slides, um, focusing on um, manager-related fees. Uh, just to recap what we do on an annual basis, for the la we've been doing it for the last eight years, is we, we gather all the fees from our managers, you know, we get it from statements that they provide directly, and we also get, we also include uh, staff-related costs, travels, um, so we take into account everything. So it's pretty comprehensive, the comprehensive fee. Uh, um, we, you know, we take into account everything, and then we, we break it down into um, manager-related fees, other fees, and then, uh, and then um, put it all together. So if you could, I mean, maybe later on, or if you've already done so, just review the fee report, the, the, the fee document, the one that, that, that's written out. But today we'll just focus on the actual presentation slide document. And really this, this document is really meant to uh, focus on just the manager-related fees, which primarily are composed of incentive fees, management fees, as well as uh, operating expenses. So the first slide, okay, good. This first slide is basically, um, we show this every year, we compare this year, which is 2000, um, so this is for the calendar year, where we do this on, on a candle calendar year basis, or so all the fees are as of 2022, at the end of two December 2022. We have the returns, um, uh, in percentages, percentage terms on the top, and then we, and then by calendar year from left to right, we chart it out. And we'll see that the, uh, the total fees went from 1.66% to 0.79%. Um, so definitely a drop in the total expense ratio, and that's for uh, the, the pension fund. Um, on, on the right side um, is a peer com comparison and this is a fiscal year basis, right? So we'll see the San Jose plan returns. Um, though those are as of the fiscal year. And you can see that where we are, we're in, we're in the kind of green uh, balloon. We're somewhere in the middle of the of of sort of where we uh, when we compare ourselves with our peers, with the Calpers and Calsters, uh, kind of more on the, on the bottom side, uh, on the lower end, and that's um, the ACFR it is not comprehensive. It's only taking into account like manager fees. So a lot of the CalPERS and CalSTRS uh, fees are um, managed internally. Their, their funds are managed internally, Next, not externally managed. Question? So the, the left side uh, bar chart, the yes. fall in incentive fees, <coughs> Yeah, so our, our incentive fees are accrued. So oh, okay. Right, so so, so therefore, um, it was it was great last year. You know, markets were booming. Now, in the private market side, um, in the private market side, it's accrued. So now that um, uh, valuations have come down, uh, there is that return to uh, something a little bit. Uh, you know, a, a lower. But, but if they're accrued, then the number would be more stable, right? Um, so the values are accrued, and when values are increasing, they tend to be positive, but in cases where we have write-downs, then the incentive fees are actually negative. So there are some asset classes where we see negative incentive fees, and that's why for the oh. plan overall, there's 0.03%, but there are some um, positive incentive fees because some private funds have continued to produce positive returns, things like private credit, whereas other things like private equity, real estate, where there have been value decreases, those have reductions in the incentive fees that are accrued. And the incentive fees that are paid are only when investments are realized and cash is returned back to us. So that wasn't the situation last year where many investments were being held longer and the values had dropped. So the incentive fees associated with those investments also declined. But wait, so when we actually pay the incentive fee, how do we, um, I mean, it's, it's a cumulative return, right? It's cumulative IRR for a, sort of a private fund. How would we adjust this? In that particular year, you'd have a big payout? Yeah, so the, the payout versus accrued, it depends on if it's an unrealized gain or a realized gain. 
So in cases where it's realized, then the manager actually realizes those uh, incentive fees. But in other cases, it's just a pa paper incentive fee for them that they've accrued, and it'll fluctuate based on the value of those investments. Okay. So the accounting of this cash, right? Yeah. So cash is not paid, but it's accrued. And then it's, uh, also for our market neutral strategies, which are mostly hedge funds, those are paid out every year, and they did hold their weight last year, or in 2022. <coughs> And so those incentive there, besides private markets, is mainly the private markets and, and the market neutral strategies, which uh, compose most of the incentive fees. Thanks. Uh, question. Um, the management fees for 2022 to 58 is 53%. Is it increased mostly from what I've seen, mostly from the private stuff that we have in our portfolio, like private uh, um, well, venture? Yeah, so we've, we've deployed um, more capital on the private market side. So, for example, we've had like 19 new funds, in the at least 19 new funds on the private market side. And so, like, uh, the the increase in management fees are is partially related to that. So we didn't decrease any passive accounts or strategies, right? We'll get to a chart later that yeah. shows the okay. passive versus active. All right. So this chart is basically the same as. Uh, um, the, the chart on the left, the total fees is similar to, or pretty much exactly the same as what was what we saw on the previous page. Um, here on the right, we see the uh, we see the total fees in dollar amounts. So we'll see that the the total fees from last year to this year, from 2021 to 2022, dropped from 76.6 to 36.7. With the emphasis of you know what we can control is our management fees is. 24.5 to 27. And going to the management fees, you know, this is the main thing that we are able to control. Operating uh, expenses and incentive fees are not things that uh, are, are not a function of things that we are able to control, but we can control our management fees. It's a function of our, our policy allocation as well as our, 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 our dis uh, ability to sort of figure out where we want to deploy the capital. And what we'll see is uh, fees overall from, from eight years ago to 2022 dropped uh, 25 basis points. Um, so uh, our most, uh, you know, and this, these numbers are also in the previous slides, so it's uh, 0 0.58%. Er Eric or Dinesh, I have a question. Given the new market dynamics for fundraising, are you seeing a little more flexibility in getting uh, better deals on management fees? I wish I could say we were, but the, the reality is that we're not. Fundraising is taking longer for fund managers, but they're reticent to provide those type of discounts. There are maybe marginally better increases in fee discounts for being an early closer or a large investor to, to help those, those funds raise their capital, but by and large, there is no significant change other than fundraising <coughs> taking longer for managers. Okay, thanks. Um, this is a decomposition of our management fees based on our passive and active strategies. Uh, so on the, on, the, on the chart to the left, we have the contribution to management fees. You'll see that the uh, contribution to the management fee from the active side um, has increased, right? Which is primarily um, private markets as well as market neutral strategies. And then on the chart on the right is our, um, the allocation to the total fund um, between our active and passive. So our, our active has, has slightly increased but our allocation to active. But back to my question, there yep. hasn't been any decrease, active decrease in the passive strategies that we invest in. We've been keeping it pretty constant. We yep. haven't decreased it. Yeah, we haven't actively decreased any passive strategies. Uh, the only difference you see there is, you know, because of our pacing plan, uh, yeah. Until we deploy assets to private markets, we put them in a passive strategy. Correct. And so as we de start deploying to private assets, some of that goes from that private see, proxy it, to. It otherwise, there's, yeah, there's an intention to hold our passive strategies. Got it. Okay. The higher passive allocation in 2020 was because of that asset allocation that increased public equity exposure during the drawdown in equity markets. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 
this is the last slide. Active management, active management fees also driven lower by reducing allocation to hedge strategies. So um, actually, so here on the left is contribution to management fees. What we'll see here is the, um, the in the blue, the private, the private markets have uh, uh, accounted for most of the increase in the contribution to management fees, right? And that's uh, what we already spoke about on the, the the chart on the right um, from four to seven percent is basically our allocation to hedged uh, the uh, hedge funds or our market neutral strategies so they've kept up their values they they you know they've they did relatively well um, despite all of 2022 and so th therefore the, the their, their, uh, their allocation has uh, nudged up incrementally Uh, with all of that, I think that's about it. Any questions? If there is no questions, I, it doesn't look like this item that we need to approve. It was just a report out, so there'll be no vote for it. Um, Eric, great job. Thank so you. Hope to hear from you more going forward. Um, Dinesh, Jay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so that is 2C. Um, I'm going to pull an audible here. Um, one of the items that uh, at the very beginning of the session that we um, added to the agenda was 4H. Uh, Maytak, maybe you could read the description on that because I don't have the description. Sure. Um, but I was hoping to uh, move that for, um, to right now. Um, but we'll. Yeah, so we, as the board, at the beginning of the meeting, there was an item that came to the board's attention after we posted the agenda under the Brown Act. And so the board took action under the uh, special provision of uh, government code 54954.2B2, a lot of numbers there, um, to add this uh, additional agenda item. The agenda item as added to the um, agenda today is discussion and action to amend our contract with our external auditors, MGO, to include an agreed upon procedure engagement to audit the inclusion of invoice management fees in the plan's investment performance for, with fees not to ex exceed $25,000 for the work under the <coughs> amendment. So with that um, description for the record of the item added, uh, I open it, I turn it back to the uh, acting chair. All right, thank you. Was there somebody from uh, management that was gonna do talk about that now. Um, I'm sorry. Are, are you waiting for yeah. me? So, so, so um, do you want me to say something? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, so sure. go ahead. Um, so yeah, an, an important issue was raised to uh, the chairs of the audit committee and others on the board uh, relating to um, uh, and raised by the investment team uh, relating to the investment fees uh, and invoicing for separate accounts in the plan. Uh, the team has recalculated and uh, taken prospective action, but uh, I think it would be prudent of the board to hire an ex uh, external auditor to address this issue, both prospectively and retrospectively, and that's the context of this recommendation. And so we'd like a motion. And will that be with uh, MGO? Yeah, with MGO. With MGO. Is, is um, Barbara or Roberto, would there be an issue? I know MGO is currently doing work, correct, um, from the finance side, right? Yes, Report. MGO is the um, external auditor that certifies the uh, plan's uh, financial statements. We actually met with MGO the last couple of days, and this will be an amendment to the contract. It will be uh, an agree upon procedures kind of work, and there's not um, no impact on the work that they do uh, for the office or their independence of performing that job. So they, they are well aware of the request, and they assure us it's, it's not an issue. Okay, so they could accommodate it. 
Correct. Do we need to approve anything for a budget or anything like that, or is it we? I, I think now? I think that we are looking for uh, not to exceed up to twenty five thousand dollars to be shared by the two plans. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. All right. So I got um, got a motion by Santos to approve um, that recommendation. Is there a second? A second. Second, second Trustee Lee. Okay, second for Trustee Lee. Any other comment, questions from trustees, public? If not, well, let's go ahead and take a, a uh, motion to approve. Is there a motion to approve? Yes, I'll be. A board to vote, I meant. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so 4-H passes. Uh, thanks for uh, accommodating that. Um, let's go to uh, old business um, 3A, discussion action on merit increases and executive days for the CEO and CIO. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the CEO uh, with, um, with our two chair and vice chair who work closely on the CEO evaluation and, and um, with Spencer on federated side. Um, with both of them present or not present today, um, I would feel more. Um, I feel it would be more appropriate to push that discussion out to next month. Um, it, I'm open for conversations if anybody else wants to talk about that, or um, we could then go on to the CIO discussion. I think we went through that very clearly, Mr. Chair. Okay. I'd like to go to the next one. All right. So let's go to the uh, CIO. Um, I'll, you know, I'll share, kick that over to Eshwar. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So um, the review for uh, the CIO, Prabhu, uh, was outstanding. Um, and uh, I've discussed uh, with uh, the chair of the Federated, uh, Anurag. Um, we've sat down and with Prabhu. Um, and our proposal is that we have a 6% increase um, and five executive days. I'll make a motion to approve the recommendation. I'll second that. Motion to approve by Wilson, second by Santos. Um, any other discussion? Public? All right, let's take a vote. Those uh, um, who approve? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that, that passes. <coughs> All right, that's 3A. 3B, uh, discussion action to approve disability committee charter. Yes, so this, this item is coming back to before the board um, from last, the last meeting, the last uh, committee charter that we put together to memorialize the board's process uh, indicated that there would be two alternates rather than um, four alternates. And here we, we changed that to include uh, four alternates just because we understand um, based from staff and also the disability committee that it's been difficult to, to get alternates um, so we can have a quorum of the board to, to adjudicate those. And so that was the only change that has been made to the disability charter from the version we presented on last week, or last month, excuse me. Um, and so that's the charter before uh, the board now for approval. I would make that motion to approve Mr. Chair. Based on Maytag's work and our staff, we had a problem with uh, people in certain vacations, whatever have you. So this clarifies that and we have more people available. So it's very healthy. I appreciate that. Yeah, we had a pretty good discussion last month, you know, on it. and. Um, I think that was the only thing that we asked to change and sounds like it got done, so I appreciate the hard work. So we got a motion by uh, Santos. Can we get a second? I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> Gardner will second it. Uh, any discussion? Public? All right, let's, uh, um, all those who approve, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And thank you all. Appreciate it. All right, on to new business, oral update by um, CEO Roberto Pena. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So if you bear with me, just a couple of items. I'd like to start by letting you know that we are planning uh, right now for open enrollment for health care for the retirees, which take place from November 1st to the 30th. Uh, it's currently in progress. The open enrollment packets for all the members will be sent out later this month. Um, and these uh, plans include in-person health fair, the second one after the first one last year after COVID. Uh, in addition to that, the members are going to have multiple 
opportunities to attend virtual online webinars and even one-on-one -on -one consultations with the vendors, the, the, the in-person retiree health uh, fair will take place on November 8th at the Lightning Center from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And on November 9th, um, all our staff will be um, presenting to the Association of Retired San Jose Police Officers and Firefighters. Um, if you bear with me, I want to also announce uh, some recruitments that we have completed in the office. Um, our disability analyst is actually retiring later this month, and we did conclude a recruitment, and a new benefits disability analyst uh, will be joining us uh, starting next month. Uh, at the next meeting, I will have some uh, background information and name on the uh, uh, new employee. We also um, hired Jani Hernandez as a senior office specialist. Uh, she's currently working in the office in a temporary role, but she's, she started her new role uh, this uh, <laughs> past Monday. Uh, our new accountant, Trambo, started on Monday, September 11th in the accounting division. Um, we also have a new benefit health analyst, uh, Tram Wynn, who started her new role uh, last month. And lastly, uh, I'm very, very happy and extremely excited to welcome Cynthia Ajala. Cynthia is sitting right uh, over there. She's our new executive assistant. Um, and I don't know who's more excited. I know I look very excited, but I know Cynthia is very excited as well for joining us. Cynthia come to us from a role that she worked on a temporary project uh, at the city HR. And before that, Cynthia spent uh, uh, many years in the private industry, including working as an executive assistant uh, in Yahoo. And Cynthia, uh, welcome. I'm very, very happy to have you. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to, but if you want to say anything, feel free. You can stand up and uh, say whatever you want. <laughs> All right, we'll take that. <laughs> so, I, I, again, I will present Cynthia to uh, federated staff, but you're going to start uh, receiving some emails, if you haven't already, from Cynthia Jala, uh, and I'm hoping that this is a, a, a long, we're hoping for a long-term relationship, Cynthia. Is that okay? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, lastly, I do want to, uh, two more things. Uh, the office will be closed on Monday uh, in Observatus Indigenous uh, People's Day. Uh, that's Monday, October 9th. Lastly, I wanted to update you. Um, we had actually issued a request for proposal for insurance broker services that actually closed last September 29th, last Friday. Um, unfortunately, we received no bids. We were really surprised. Um, and what we found out is that, well, a couple of things. Um, apparently, the request for proposal uh, was very lengthy, <laughs> and it required a lot of information. And I think the challenge here is that this particular service um, for an insurance broker um, actually pays less than a large, large contract. They just get a commission for the insurance that, that they can get for the, uh, for the boards. In any event, what I wanted to mention is that we actually went ahead based on the internal audit of recommendation and, uh, and you know, when they provided information on the insurance broken and the review of the procurement rules. And so that's why we ended up issuing an RFP. As it turns out, um, the actual commissions that I expected on this job is around 70,000, which means that it qualifies under an RFQ rather than an RFP. So RFQ is actually less rigorous. It asks for less information, and it's easier to apply. So we will be issuing an RFQ. We actually spoke to uh, city staff on those issues and purchasing, and so they are working on preparing an RFQ in which at least three vendors uh, will be provided to them, and hopefully we can hear from those vendors. So bottom line is, we didn't get any bids, we're gonna change the process to an RFQ, and we hope 
to have more information for you at you, uh, the November meeting. That concludes my update, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Roberto. Is there any questions for Roberto? Have you ever done an RFQ before? Or? We have. Um, we have done it for uh, the last time, I believe, that we hire um, actual okay. services. Okay. So but I mean usually we do an RFP, yes. Is there uh, a way to, uh, what's the right word, publicize that the RFQ? Yeah, yes. so we're working with purchasing at the city to prepare and to, uh, to be sent to at least three vendors. So we do fully expect to to get bids. In fact, we did reach out to our current insurance broker to ask why they didn't bid the first time, and that's how we learned oh, okay. of how complicated uh, for the amount of fee that they were receiving. So they will be, uh, we fully expect them to respond to the RFQ. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Benji, are you, I apologize, I don't have the Zoom. Are you in the meeting remotely? I guess it's not. <laughs> okay, very well. Yeah, well, what I meant by publicize is, I mean, it'll be nice if we can uh, get more than one quote. Uh, absolutely. We, we're hoping for at least three, and we're going to be reaching out to vendors uh, for the RFQ, which is a lot easier for them to respond to than an RFP. Yeah. Sorry, yes. I finally found my words. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Roberto? If not, we'll go ahead and move on to 4B, Council Member Foley. Welcome. Good morning. Hi there. It's a long closed session today. <laughs> Would have liked to have been a fly on the wall in that meeting. <laughs> um, uh, Andrew, first, thank you for being sitting in our council meeting, uh, I think, last week and uh, making a presentation on your proposal. Uh, I assume you've all been updated on that, but the council, the the increases and the change in the salary range affects not just the positions here on the on uh, with the retirement services but it affects other salary positions as well mostly our council appointees the council uh, appoints a few individuals including the city manager the city auditor and the any increase here affects them as well so we authorized a study to be done on all of our uh, higher level positions with a report to come back in 90 days to get an idea of what that means in our uh, respective uh, peer groups that we take a look at. Just just an update to so you know that it's not that we didn't even really discuss at council the merits of the, the increases that were requested as uh, we were more concerned about making sure that it's fair for all of our employee groups. And that's it. I really don't have anything else. Thank you. Unless you have any questions. All right. Thank you. Any questions for yeah. Council Member? Um, yeah, Council Member uh, Ham. <laughs> I've been around a long time, and I can't recall anybody ever running for office, and nobody opposed them. <laughs> so I say congratulations to you. It's obviously you're doing a good job because nobody stood up. So things must be going okay. But I thank you for your service. I appreciate that. <laughs> Just a side note, I was actually called in for jury duty this week and last week, and I was put on the panel. Uh, they asked me about my relationship with the police department because it was a criminal case. And I said, oh, I have, well, you know, you already have to disclose that. And I said, well, I do sit on the police and fire retirement board and blah, blah, blah. But after a day and a half, they finally excused me off the panel. <laughs> I wish they made that decision a lot earlier, but... You know, a day and, and a half. <laughs> uh, a day and a half to get to that. It was going to be a seven-year, seven-week case, so oh. I was really glad to be removed from that one. But just sh sharing a little personal thing. Uh, one, one thing. Uh, you know, I let me digress just a little bit. Um, this isn't related to this board, but it is related to the city of San Jose and to what's happening at the city, and that's related to our unhoused residents and our emergency interim housing. Today, we, we have been uh, given uh, actually a gift from the governor for 200 of these emergency interim housing units. And it, the, it's a gift because they're free. 
and the state is actually going to install them. So the infrastructure is free and the units themselves are free. But we go to VTA today because the location, we don't have the land for it in the city of San Jose. VTA does and we've asked them to consider the approving it today. Last meeting we pushed for a draft agreement to bring in a proposal for 200 units at the Cerrone site, which is their maintenance, one of their maintenance yards, and we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm uh, very supportive of that. Transitional housing is important. We need permanent housing, but transitional housing can be implemented so much more quickly and we, with services provided, and we really need to get folks off our streets. So that's just important. Actually, from a police and fire standpoint, because once these are in, installed, the calls for service for police and fire go way down for that population. So we wanna make sure that we, we get these in. If you happen to be interested in participating in a VTA meeting, you can Zoom at <laughs> 6.30 time certain and share your thoughts about why this is a great idea and why VTA should approve it. I serve as a director, so I will be there. <laughs> well, well, thank the, you. To the chair, uh, Council Member Foley uh, had the chance to be in the first meeting with the mayor, had an emergency type meeting and educated everybody. And last night there was over 90 participants and he made an excellent presentation and uh, very supportive of what you're saying. Uh, that area is next to Alviso. We're very concerned, but very positive. Yeah, in fact, uh, District 4, that your area has the fourth highest unhoused population in the city, yep. which I, I was actually surprised to learn that, but uh, we need to take care of those individuals and find them housing, and this is one step. It's There's not many, the solution, yeah. it's just one step. There's many reasons, but if you know that area, which you do, yeah. across the way on the frontage road, there's a complete village, which I will control, yep. and they go into our course, our creeks, and whatever have you, yep. and I'll go on that. So I believe that <clears throat> that process and that location is excellent. Yeah, it absolutely is. So let's hope VTA directors agree with us. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, any other questions for the council member? If not, we'll go ahead and go to 4C and D. Um, I think it's the board's favorite conversation every year that we look forward to seeing Bill and Ann. Um, talk about actuary stuff. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just want to welcome uh, back Bill mm -hmm. and Ann from the actuarial firm of Chiron. Um, you're probably going to be very happy to hear that uh, Bill is probably going to be joining your board meetings for the next <laughs> four months. You're happy, but not as happy as he is. As he's <laughs> so, good to see you both, and welcome back. Thank you. Um, uh, it's good to see everyone again in person. It's been a while. Uh, we know that uh, you all follow changes in actuarial standards very closely, but just in <laughs> case you missed it, uh, we wanted to at least make you aware uh, of some changes that are uh, affecting some of the disclosures in the valuation report and public plans in general. So this is just a quick informational item so that you're aware, and in particular so that you don't get caught off guard. Let's see if I can change the slide here. There we go. Um, the this Actuarial Standards Board uh, changed the primary standard that governs the pension uh, practice, and it had not been revised for about 10 years. Uh, they've been working through a thorough process, and, and the, the changes primarily affect public pension plans, and there are three changes in particular uh, that we wanted to run through. Uh, these will affect what's in your report. Uh, they are not going to affect the contributions or anything we're, we're really uh, doing and focused on, but we want to make sure you know in case somebody else picks this up where there's particular concern that the last item on the list here can be, might be picked up um, by other people and you could be asked a question about it. So we just want to kind of prep the ground in case that happens. Okay, so I'm going to cover the first two items. Um, 
that um, are impactful to the disclosures in your report. Um, the first is to disclose a reasonable actuarial determined contribution, or ADC. So not only does that need to be disclosed, but it needs to be calculated, disclosed, and then um, in your report. So even prior to this revision, most uh, systems in California uh, have been doing this because they were following the guidance of the California Actuarial Advisory Panel and also the con uh, Conference of Consulting Actuaries because their guidance is very similar to what this revised ASAP uh, requirements are. Um, so with the definition of a reasonable ADC, it's just that there's reasonable assumptions and cost methods. Um, San Jose has always been doing this within their funding policy, so there's absolutely no impact on your system. Um, the second piece is to assess implications of your funding policy, and what that really means is how is your unfunded accrued liability being paid for over time and the impact on your contributions and funded status as a result. Um, and the ASAP addresses two main issues. The first is, is the funding policy designed to fully pay for that unfunded accrued liability? And second, uh, when uh, will the contributions start paying for uh, principal on the unfunded accrued liability? So that second item um, can be seen for your plan in the chart here, which shows uh, a comparison of the city uh, and member contribution rates compared to the normal cost, which is the cost of active members accruing benefit for the year, and the interest on your unfunded. And that difference between those two bars is the chunk that is being paid for to pay down the principal on your unfunded accrued liability. So in this chart here, it's about 25% of payroll, which is a very large piece of the portion of your contribution to pay for that. Um, and then again, the funding policy, uh, when is it, f is it designed to fully pay for your unfunded accrued liability? And the answer for San Jose Police and Fire is yes, because you have those closed amortization periods and um, it is designed to fully pay for your unfunded accrued liability. I had, I had a question. How does this compare to something like yours in, in the state of California? You know, you, you said the 25% in the 26, 26 years. Do you have a sense? Um, I believe it's one of the higher percentages. Even there are plans that are even better funded than you may be, but they're still not paying that huge chunk of unfunded. So it's a very large portion. I have other systems that pay only closer to like four or five percent right now. Mm. Okay. So nationally, I don't yeah. know the California numbers, um, but nationally, about half the plans are not making a contribution. Uh, that equals normal cost plus interest. And so that was one of the motivations to have this disclosure uh, so that people would know uh, when the contributions weren't sufficient to, to pay the interest on the unfunded liability. The, uh, the 26 years, that's, uh, that's a fairly typical period in California. The five-year asset smoothing is very common across the country and in California. Uh, the 20 year amortization period uh, is, is also very common. It can be somewhere between 15 and 25. Uh, nationally, again, that's probably where things break down. You have plans that have fixed contribution rates so they don't adjust them when things happen. Uh, and those fixed contribution rates a lot of times they're really not adequate. Uh, and then there are some other longer amortization periods that we see nationally. Mm -hmm. okay, and there are you. some systems that still do the rolling amortization where you refinance that, uh, that remaining debt, that unfunded, over the same period every year. So it essentially never is going to pay for the yeah. unfunded accrued liability. Interesting. OK, thank you. And going back to the, the first piece of requiring the disclosure of a reasonable actuarially determined contribution, uh, a lot of systems across the country disclose an actuarially determined contribution, but it may not meet the reasonable standards. And so they really wanted to draw a line there. Um, and so it's really trying to highlight the outliers uh, within the public pension plans. And, and so it, it ends up not really having an effect on you at all. Um, but 
it's an important step forward, I think, nationally. Right, and like you said, um, a lot of state plans are fixed rate plans where it's just one statutory rate that they contribute, hoping that that's enough. Um, they still have to disclose a reasonable ADC and calculate it, the actuary does, even if it's not going to be what's made to the pension fund, so that there's that comparison there, kind of like a guardrail, so you can compare it to what a reasonable ADC would be. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So um, the more controversial uh, change is that you're in the funding valuation, you're required to calculate and disclose what's called a low default risk obligation measure. Uh, and, and so this is essentially, the idea behind this is uh, what would it cost to create a matching portfolio that exactly matched your benefit payments? So if you see on the chart there, this is not your plan, it's just a sample plan of benefit payments going out as the green bars. You look at the, the yield curve for a high quality bond index, and so that's, we put one up for, with the blue line that shows the yield on bonds that would mature at each of those dates. And you match, the uh, theoretical idea is you match that up, and if so, then you're not really concerned about investment risk, you're only concerned about whether they default on the bond, uh, because the bonds will mature and you'll have the cash to make your, your benefit payments. Uh, it is very theoretical exercise because as you can see on that line after 30 years, we just used the yield at 30 years and stretched it out because uh, your benefit <coughs> payments go much longer than there's really a robust and deep uh, market for uh, fixed income securities. Um, on the investment side, you hear about LDI strategies, uh, that's really what this is getting at. So the discount rate we have to use has to be uh, derived from low default risk fixed income securities and the cash flows have to be reasonably consistent with the pattern of benefits. So reasonably is gonna do a lot of work in the next few years as, as people are implementing this, uh, but this, theoretically represents the minimum risk portfolio that, that uh, you could adopt. So is this, uh, essentially, intuitively, does this just mean that if all our assets were sitting in a treasury portfolio, what would be the? Yes, how much would you need to have uh, to be 100% funded if you were all in a treasury portfolio where you matched? Except they allow us to use high quality corporate so we're well, thank God they didn't do this uh, for the last 15 years. Right, I know. The, ti <laughs> the timing here is actually very good. <laughs> um, we are planning to use uh, what's called the, the FTSE Pension Liability Index. It's based on high-quality uh, corporate bonds. Uh, it is just an index number, but when I've tested the index in a variety of uh, scenarios, it matches reasonably well with your uh, cash flows. And so uh, that allows us to just use a single number and we'll be able to use the same number for both police and fire and federated, not have something slightly different. Um, it, it, is, it has been used uh, in the corporate world for their accounting disclosures. And so it's a well-recognized uh, index. We ha also have some options on what actuarial cost method we use. Uh, I think most uh, actuaries are gonna use the same method they're using for funding the plan, and that, that's our intent. Uh, we use what's called the entry age method. Uh, so this combination will give you um, a, an approximate value. If you actually wanted to try and explore investing this way, we'd wanna get a little more precise than what we are, but we're not uh, suggesting that at all. So uh, one way to think about what this number represents is, is you could start with that whole projection of benefit payments and just add it up. And that's your undiscounted uh, cash flow. And, and we're only focusing on the, the benefit payments that are attributed to past service. So 
nothing earned in the future. In the valuation, we discount all of those by the expected return on your portfolio, which is a diversified portfolio. It has uh, uh, some level of risk, but you've balanced the risk by, through diversification. And so that gives us that AAL, the actuarial liability uh, that we use in the valuation. The LD-ROM is really effectively just using a lower discount rate because the yield on that matching portfolio is typically lower than the yield on the diversified portfolio. And, and so we're gonna end up with a larger value. That uh, difference between that LD-ROM value and what we're using as the actuarial li liability can be thought of in a couple ways. It really represents the, the um, expected savings from investing in the diversified portfolio versus a matching portfolio. But expected is a key word there because you don't know how it plays out until after the fact. Uh, it could also be thought of as the cost for reducing that investment risk or eliminating that investment risk to get to that portfolio. So um, we're focusing our communications on, on that difference and the implications in an in investment uh, structure. There are other approaches uh, with different combinations, so other actuaries may do things uh, a little bit differently, but we think setting it in the context of the, the um, investment returns and, and the, the risk that you've decided to take in the diversified portfolio is probably the best um, and easiest to explain. So uh, just so I'm clear, so the LD-ROM is a disclosure item that goes into the actuarial report that's going to be implemented starting w in which valuation? This one. This one the that's 2023 coming valuation. Okay. Yes. And then um, for that, uh, okay, thank you. So uh, so I'm going to talk about how we're going to put it in the report so you can find it uh, if you want to find it and see the discussion. Um, in uh, We have an assessment and disclosure of risk section in our valuation report. And in that, uh, we've often included a sensitivity to the discount rate. Uh, for your financial statements, we already have to show plus and minus uh, 1%. And so we have uh, an illustration here with that plus and minus 1%, how the liability changes. And our intent is we'll just add one more bar there that will be the, the low default risk obligation measure liability. Uh, and then we will explain that difference. I already uh, explained uh, my bullet point there on the prior slide. Um, the, these are just samples taken from the 2022 uh, valuation, but the, but the LD-ROM interest rate for 2023 will be 4.92% uh, using that, that index. So will this, um, so people will start looking at plans, uh, comparing plans on this LD-ROM number? Is that what you expect to happen? Yeah, well, so there are certain organizations that already have been creating their own version. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with ALEC. Um, but they come out with a report every year where they convert state um, retirement system liabilities to a treasury rate. Uh, interesting, this year when interest rates went up, they decided to use an average rate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, their point is they've tried to make the political point that these plans are undervalued and they're really more expensive than, than what your actuaries are telling them. And so that's part of the concern about how uh, this number could be used and, and because it will be public in your VAL report. Um, that's one of the potential issues. Do we have a sense or will we have a sense soon how we compare with others? Uh, uh, no, we don't have a good sense. I guess um, there have been reports that have converted your number. I think uh, Joe Nation, when he was at Heritage, uh, did some calculations 
but they've been very spotty, and so the comparisons are um, hard to hard to come by, uh, especially involving cities. The the more common comparisons are at a state level. So, just one more question. Sorry, um, is are you choosing this uh, benchmark liability, whatever it is, uh, FTSE pension liability index? across all your clients, or is it something that you apply to us? Uh, <laughs> I am choosing it across all my clients. I don't know that Chiron is. Uh, there can be circumstances where I might want to use something different, where uh, there are multiple employer uh, plans where they have a uh, withdrawal liability, so that if an employer wants to withdraw, I think you might Wait, want so to use Do that. we get a say in this? That's you do get a say if you don't want, um, it, it, I mean, we can use a lot of different things. We're uh, planning to use the, the FTSE, but if you would prefer <coughs> us to look up treasury rates or um, do something else, we, we could do that. Uh, yes, I think I'll let the other fixed income folks weigh in, but we should, yeah, we should have a conversation about this. FTSE, just from what I know. I don't know, I haven't thought about it. industry standards been yeah. the industry standard for a long time. It used to be called something else. Right, Fifty it was the city group. city group yeah. index, so that's been established forever. Wh which one, I'm sorry? It used to be owned by City Solomon. I'd go back, way back. It was originally the Solomon Smith Barney index, yes. and then it became the city group uh, index, and then uh, now it's the FTSE index. And so it's been used by corporate pension plans oh. for, okay. um, you know, back to the late 80s. I mean, I think this is a discussion we should have before this starts getting officially reported because to the extent we have an index which matches our um, strategy better since we are in an endowment model. I'm not saying, I mean, I know that you're trying to measure the, the benefit of asset allocation, but if we compare badly ac across plans, I don't know what are the, what's the downside of that? Well, we're only reporting it, right? We're not actually going to start using the 7.1. We're going to stick with this 5.7. Yeah, but if, we, if people co start comparing yeah. us yeah. across the board and other people are using higher discount rates, uh, it, it, it has to be risk-free, I guess. So, so, it, so it, it's uh, emerging uh, on what different systems are going to use. Uh, from a survey at the enrolled actuaries meeting, it was kind of split between uh, most people either using the FTSE index or treasuries. Uh, treasuries would be lower. Uh, the other one that uh, is named and, and potentially common is the municipal bond index. And I know uh, at least one major actuarial firm has decided to, to use that, um, which I think we were going to get to the required explanations, and personally, I think it's difficult to explain what the meaning of the measure is if you're using the municipal bond index. Um, but either corporate bond index or treasury index um, is very clear. And, and so <laughs> using the corporate index, we would have a higher discount rate than those using the Treasury index. I mean, what is a well, Barclays the Barclays index is, is representative of a low default risk index, which Treasury is almost default free, I guess. Right, right. So I guess it fits the name. I mean, we should compare it to some Barclays Ag or something. I don't know what the current yield is, but uh, I just don't want us to set something up which we can't change, that's all. Well, so you can so change it. Yeah, so let me just make a point of clarification. So the the the, the LD ROM disclosure is just a number that's used for the included for a comparison point for the public. But for our purposes as a public pension board, we will still use our actuarial valuations and all yeah. of our actuarial values. And so for now, um, this I believe this is the first year we're rolling this out. So it's kind of you know touch and go and figure out what's the standard industry and how how we go about deciding which index and stuff like that. But good point on like you know maybe having that discussion sooner um, before going into the valuation. That th that's a fair point. But I did want to make very clear to the board that we're not abandoning our actuarial approaches for our valuations. Right. Yeah, you can't change that what you're using as your. Uh, 
the default measure every year. You're not stuck with one measure. Yeah, we, we want to, okay, that's good to know. I think that's what Andrew was saying. I guess we want to use the highest yielding risk-free index <laughs> we can. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so I, I think I, I that. Don't mean, I don't mean to belabor this. Yeah, but, uh, I, I think that's kind of where one of the rationales behind using this FTSE index is it's the highest among the indices. Now, in the, in the corporate world, those who've gone away from the index cr start creating their own bond models and, and uh, they can develop even higher uh, interest rates based on their, their customized bond models. Because for them, it makes a real difference though. Yeah. And for us, it, it's really just a reference point to keep in mind. And so I don't think it's, um, we're not recommending we go to that length and trouble for this type of disclosure. So I think the using an index is probably the, um, the easiest approach. It gets us uh, at a pretty high discount rate uh, compared to the alternatives and um, is simple to, to an employ. Thanks. Okay, so the last piece of this LD-ROM and the significance of it is that the ASOP says that we are required to explain the significance of the LD-ROM with respect to the funded status, contributions, and the security of benefits. Um, and this doesn't have to be a quantitative um, um, explanation. It can be qualitative, and it does require professional judgment as to what is appropriate. And so far, we've kind of seen the two ends of the goalpost, where we've seen some actual firms come out and say, well, we're not 100% invested in fixed income security, so this has no impact on our valuation. And then we've also seen some other firms that are um, actually they're not just calculating the LD-ROM, but they're also calculating what the funded status would be compared to the valuation funded status. So our approach is going to be somewhere in the middle there. And this on the last slide here is just a sample language um, summarizing uh, qualitatively what we will add as language in the report. Um, and so I can go into more detail here, but for brevity, I think maybe we'll move on to the economic assumption review, unless anyone has any questions. Zoom at home where I have three screens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, this is our annual review of the pension economic assumptions, and um, let's see if we can get going here. Uh, but before we get into the review, I wanted to just give you a heads up on what's coming up. Uh, so. We're doing the, the economic assumption review this meeting. Next meeting, we've got the demographic experience study. So we're gonna look at mortality rates, retirement rates, turnover rates, uh, all those sorts of things. We do that every other year for this plan. Um, but there's a lot of data involved. Uh, we will also take a look at the OPEB assumptions. So that's gonna be a real heavy assumptions meeting. And then in December, we'll get you the final uh, pension valuation and show you the projections and, and where things are and give you a heads up on the OPEB and where that, that's looking. And then we don't do anything in January here, but we come back February uh, and give you the final OPEB uh, numbers. Yeah, we should have graduation certificates when we for surviving four or five months of actuaries. <laughs> uh, 
Um, our preliminary look, we, uh, we took last year's valuation and uh, just assumed all assumptions were met on the liability side and added in the investment returns uh, for the year. And so the, the, this is the, the graph of the unfunded liability and how it's expected to be paid off. The dark blue line is what we had projected from the valuation and the red bars are the adjusted numbers. So you can see uh, things are a little better th than expected on this front, but uh, it's not much different. It's very close. Uh, so the investment returns were a little better than expected, but uh, not enough to move things dramatically. After the last two years, that's kind of a, a nice thing. Uh, and similarly, here we're looking at contributions with uh, rates on the left and dollar amounts on the right. And again, the blue line is the prior projection and the gold bars are adjusted for the investment returns. Uh, now, keep in mind we still have, uh, have to take into account the demographic changes and census changes uh, and then any assumption changes that we uh, adopt uh, next month or today. Uh, the one other thing I want to point out to you on here uh, is we're sneaking something into the economic assumption review because if you look at the contributions here that go down and then pop back up, that's not our favorite pattern. Uh, to have contributions go go down and then immediately have to go back up. And that's being driven by the great investment returns in 2021, followed by lousy returns in 2022, and our asset smoothing, because those things are staggered off. And so uh, at the end of this, we're going to propose a, a fix to this uh, by just making a one-time tweak to our asset smoothing. So I'm going to do just an overview and then a recap of what um, assumptions, economic assumptions were adopted last year. Um, so as Bill was saying, uh, we come every year to the board and review the economic assumptions and then the demographic experience study is performed every two years. Um, so the assumptions that we adopt uh, today and next month will be used in the 2023 actual evaluation and that determines the contributions for the fiscal year ending 2025. So last year, um, the board adopted to increase price inflation from 2.25% to 2.5%, and as well as uh, the same increases to the amortization payment rate, uh, which is tied with, it, with your plan to the inflation. So we, to keep those consistent, uh, those were increased. The wage inflation, um, we had recommended increasing um, from 3% to 3.25%, and the board had decided to maintain it at 3% to postpone that decision till this year in case there were going to be discussions on raising the discount rate this year. So, because if you had adopted the 3.25% wage inflation last year, the contribution rates would have gone up because wage inflation is tied to salary increases for active members and you projecting higher benefits, so there's higher costs there, so the rates would have gone up. But then this year, if you decide or is the decision to raise the discount rate, then rates would again drop the following year. So the board had decided just to let's you know stay the course with that as well and, and wait one year and see what we're going to do with the discount rate. And so again, that's where we are with the discount rate. There was no change last year. The board decided to wait to see if these uh, market increases in the capital market assumptions um, were just temporary or if they were going to stick and um, that's where the board left it just to remain consistent with that assumption. So in developing the economic assumptions, uh, we use the traditional traditional building block approach. 
Um, and that's where price inflation is the foundation of all of your economic assumptions. So your current price inflation assumption is 2.5%. It really, even though it's a building block, has very little direct impact on its own in terms of your plan because of how your COLAs are structured. Your Tier 1 members have a fixed 3% COLA regardless of, of inflation or any other measure. Um, you have a small group of Tier 1 members who get a guaranteed purchasing power uh, of their benefit, but that's a very small group and very old group of retirees. And so then also your Tier 2 COLAs are capped at 2% and are tied to the CPI of the Bay Area, but um, they're capped at 2%. So this chart here is showing the break-even inflation, um, which is the difference between the yield on treasuries minus the yield on your tips. And um, this is basically a market indicator of what future inflation um, is a consensus with investors. And so even though the inflation uh, for year ending August 31st, year over year, was about 3.7%, three and, and that's actually come down um, over the last you know eight months, the year over year was as high as 6 or 7%. Um, so e even though we've had re recently high inflation, um, this break-even inflation is lower, at around 2.2 or 2.6 percent, depending on which time horizon you're looking at. So, uh, close to what your two and a half percent assumption is. So, in this chart next, we're looking at two surveys um, and two peer group comparison of inflation expectations. On the far left is a survey of professional forecasters as of the third quarter of 2023. And you can see their range of inflation is more significant. It's about, you know, goes from 1.75% to 3.1% with a median of 2.4%. Then you have your Horizon Survey, which is a survey of about 40 different investment consultants across the country, a little bit narrower of a range, but right around that 2.4% is the median. Um, the, uh, the third bar on the right there is the, uh, is the um, results of the public plan database and looking at all the assumptions in the, nationally for public sector pension plans. And again, the median is right around two and a half. Um, and then we also do our own California survey. Um, and again, the median is two and a half percent. So not sounding like a broken record, but that two and a half percent is still reasonable and your investment consultants uh, have an expectation similar. So the next uh, assumption is this wage inflation assumption that we're looking at. Um, and the wage inflation is basically an overall wage increase across the board for members. Um, there's another piece, with it's called the merit or a longevity uh, promotion assumption, and that we look at and analyze when we do the demographic experience study. So right now we're just focusing on the wage inflation assumption across the board increases. Currently, your wage inflation assumption is at 3%, um, which is the median and the most common uh, wage inflation assumption right now in California. We also look at historical data. Um, and this is historical data, which is on the left-hand side of this uh, slide, shows the wage inflation uh, from local governments over a five-year period, the last 10 years and the last 20-year period. Um, so in the last five years, because of the higher inflation, there's been higher wage growth. It's about 4.33%. But then when you look out 20 years for local governments, it's closer to your current assumption of 3%. Um, but we also look at, when we are doing our valuation, we look at the uh, most recent bargained agreements so that we tie those agreements into our liabilities when we do the valuation. So we're going to be including um, the 2024 and 2025 bargain increases uh, for both police and fire. But then after, when there's no bargaining um, agreement available, we'll use that 3% assumption. So we still think 3% is reasonable, but we are cons uh, asking you to consider increasing it to 3.25%.
And lastly, before we get to the, uh, the main focus of this uh, presentation, we're go uh, we, I'm going to talk about the amortization payment, um, which is currently uh, tied to inflation of 2.5%. And so when we calculate your amortiz an amortization payment for a layer of actual gain or loss or an assumption change, we build into that that the, that payment is going to increase at 2.5% or the rate of inflation. So this as a percentage of payroll, this UAL payment is expected to gradually decline over time because we're expecting your payroll to grow at 3%. So as a percentage of pay, these amortization payments are expected to slowly decline over time. Um, and so we're recommending maintaining this connection to the price inflation assumption at the 2.5%. No changes proposed there. Okay, the, the discount rate, uh, we talk about this every year, it's the most powerful assumption. The higher our expected return, the lower uh, the expected contributions. Uh, but ultimately it is gonna depend on what actual returns are uh, more than the assumption. Our current assumption is six and five eighths uh, and we really, we set some context looking at the historical experience and what others are doing, um, but really the, the primary focus is on expectations for the future uh, and any sort of uh, level of risk or conservatism that the, the board wants to incorporate. Uh, so this chart's showing our uh, expected return in the red line uh, over the last 10 years compared to the return on the market value and the return on the actuarial value. Uh, and you can see preliminarily the uh, return this year on the uh, market value was about 8%, but on the actuarial value about six and a half. If we look historically, uh, this is looking at California systems. Uh, your system is the gold diamond on the left and the bars represent the range of uh, discount rates used in California. And you can see we were among the first to move to lower discount rates and, and have uh, maintained that. Uh, lately there have been a couple plans that have uh, come down uh, below us, but uh, we are still uh, among the lower discount rates in California. There, uh, even last year though, uh, you'll note that discount rates came down. On the right hand side, you see the breakout of the California systems and who had what, how many had what discount rate. Uh, a year ago, 7%, I think had 19, uh, different plans and that's come down to 10. Uh, most of those went into the six and three quarters or some six, I think a couple six and three quarters went to six and a half. Um, but so the downward trend continued through last year. Who was using 6%? Do you remember? Yeah, I do. It's, um, it's San Diego Transit and I'm actually the one of the co-leads on that plan and the reason that that's at 6% though is it's a closed system and it's okay. been closed for a number of years. So they have a very conservative asset allocation. Okay. It's, yeah. At the end of the PowerPoint, we have a table that has all the systems and their assumptions. Okay. So you can take a look. Six, six and a quarter. Is that? Six and a quarter. Six and a quarter. Is that San Mateo? That's San Mateo, yeah. Right. Yep. San Mateo. San Mateo County, yeah. And they, yeah. Uh, so we've been talking for quite a while about how uh, interest rates have gone down uh, much faster than the discount rate. Uh, when interest rates go down, the expected returns also go down. And so what we've seen nationally and for your plan is a reduction in the discount rate, but not as much as interest rates went down, and more complexity in the asset allocation in order to achieve that higher expected return. 
we are now seeing, just in the last year, a significant change in those discount rates so that um, expected risk premium, the difference between our expected return and uh, a risk-free rate, which we're using the 10-year Treasury as a proxy for, uh, has become much smaller. Uh, and so uh, that puts us in a much better position uh, and, and you'll see that it's really changed the, the capital market assumptions. The question, of course, is going to be, is that temporary or how long is that going to last? So uh, every year we get uh, Makita's capital market assumptions, and then we use the capital, the average capital market assumptions in the Horizon survey of investment consultants. So there's 42 uh, consultants who provide 10-year time horizon, and 27 also provide 20-year horizons. And uh, so then we calculate the probability over those time frames of achieving different levels of return. And the, the median has gone up to uh, 7.3 to 7.9 for the 10-year time frame and 7.6 to 8.5 for the 20-year time frame. Uh, I, I do want to point out, since Makita is higher than the horizon, w one of the differences it is simply Makita knows the sub-asset classes better than the horizon survey. So. For example, Horizon just has a private equity class, whereas Makita knows how much you have in buyouts, how much in venture capital, and, and that sort of thing. And so that can, it's not completely apples to apples comparison here. Is that to, the most up-to-date Horizon survey? And I it is. It comes out with a delay? It, yeah, it came out in August. The, most of the assumptions, uh, as we understand it, are based on December. Uh, uh, capital markets, which is the same as the Makita assumptions. But uh, if you compare this to what we had a year ago, uh, you're looking at uh, a very significant change, uh, at least 150 basis points higher than, than a year ago. And so we actually want to show you that this is um, it, because those assumptions move around as the markets move around, we want to look at the, the history. And we've typically wanted uh, you to have an assumption that's between the 10-year and the 20-year number. So the gray bars here are just the range from the 10-year to the 20-year the on the assumptions. And we're looking at Makita's assumptions, and then the diamond is what we actually used as our discount rate for that year. And so one of the things to note here is in 2019, we had a big spike up that quickly reversed itself. Um, so now we've got another um, big move up that's really being driven by the, the uh, rising interest rates and the actions of the Federal Reserve uh, and other changes in, in the market. Uh, and so, um, the question is, how long uh, do we expect that to last? I do not know the answer to that question. I'm just uh, posing that question. Are and I don't know if <laughs> yeah, SR looks anxious to jump in. Are any systems asking whether it's appropriate to raise the discount rate, right? It's the natural question to ask. Yeah. And so, yes, some, que some are asking. I have not seen anyone actually do, do it. it yeah. And so, I mean, that kind of leads to where we're going with this. We're suggesting not changing this year. Hang, hang on where you are. Let's see how the mm -hmm. markets develop and what, um, see if we can see better next year uh, where, where things are. Because it's really not clear if or when the interest rates may, may come back down. Um, but what we know is it's much easier to raise the discount rate than it is to lower it. Uh, it took us a long time to bring it down. We had to go down very slowly because it impacts member contribution rates, it impacts the city's contribution rate, 
And, and so we wanna be extremely cautious before we start uh, ramping it up. And, and it's okay for the discount rate to be less than the expected rate of return. It just means you have a better chance of achieving that. When you're in the reverse situation, it, it's a lot tougher uh, to, to justify. So, um, so we're suggesting that we, we hang on with no change to the discount rate this year and, and revisit that question again next year as we always do. Just another question on the Horizon Survey versus the Makita. I've only been involved in, uh, on the board for maybe a little over a year, and I've seen the Makita uh, survey being more uh, volatile, maybe. I, I guess I, it's a question. Versus the Horizon survey, which is, like you said, it's a survey of 40 consultants, so it doesn't seem to change as rapidly versus the one Makita expected return numbers. Is that the case? I mean, you only show 2023. I don't know what. It looks yeah, like we're not showing the history of the Horizon yeah. numbers, but but um, without looking at it, I think you are correct that because it's um, it's a it's 40 different investment consultants you're getting, and we're taking just the average. Uh, right. They, you probably don't see quite as much volatility from year to year as you would picking any individual consultant. But also the difference between. Horizon and Makita, has that always been this large or? No, it has not always been this far. Um, okay. Can I weigh in? This is Laura from Makita. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Can you all hear me? I just wanted to mention our assumptions do not typically change as much as they did in the last year. <laughs> yeah. We just had a historically yes. <laughs> unique market environment with the huge um, increase in interest rates and also equity returns being uh, depressed during 2022. Um, we, we do evaluate all of our models on a qualitative basis, but it didn't feel right to us to sort of artificially adjust the expectations down to try to get the change to be less than in prior years. Um, alternatively, we just tried to educate boards on, you know, not making big changes to their asset allocation based on the, the change in capital market assumptions jumping quite a bit in one year. Thank you, Laura. That's why I add a caveat that I've only had one year exposure, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, they normally do not change that much. Thank you. And to her point, you can um, you, you can see that somewhat here with the prior gray bars. They they've moved a little bit. There was the one exception in 2019 when when things moved. But and if we extended it back further, the the changes are much more gradual. This is really an exceptional change that we're seeing from everyone. So because the assumptions are, are typically set in December, uh, December happened to be when there was a spike up in interest rates and the equity markets uh, fell. Yeah, December of the prior year. December 18. So and so it, it had like completely reversed itself four months later or something. Yes, we did, although we knew that it had reversed itself already. <laughs> but you had a better idea last time. Right now, you really have no idea. Right now, no, we do not know where the future is going. <laughs> I don't think interest rates are going to change that much within a year. <laughs> um, any other questions on the discount rate before I move to the asset smoothing piece? Okay. Uh, so I alluded to this, but uh, in the 2022 valuation, uh, you know, we're recognizing uh, each year's investment gain or loss, the difference between what we expected and the actual return, over a five-year period. And in the 2022 valuation, if you looked at where we were, there was still $86 million in uh, deferred investment losses that we hadn't recognized, if you net out everything we had done so far. 
This year, we're adding in 63 million in investment gains. So over the next five years, we need to recognize about $23 million in investment losses in our actuarial value of assets that aren't currently in there. But because of the pattern of 2021 and 2022, uh, we're not doing that in an even manner. We're recognizing gains first, net gains first because of the power of 2021. And then when we get out to 2026, we have to recognize a large loss that year and it's a big swing. Uh, and then we're back to the, the small gain. So uh, Anne referred earlier to the CCA paper on uh, actuarial funding methods. And one of the things it talks about is if you have this situation, you can reset things so that you are just recognizing it smoothly over the five years. And so we end up with just a small recognition each year o over five years, and we don't get that uh, down and then up. And so we're recommending that, um, that you do that. It would have the impact of reducing the actuarial assets, this valuation, by about $5 million. Can I, can I just pause for one second? So under, uh, in the, under the Brown Act, our, our, our discussion and actions were only limited to the economic assumptions. I didn't have a chance to take a look at this. This looks like a, um, a funding policy issue that I haven't checked against our, our board documents that we may need to re-agendize, at least this portion of your presentation for next month, uh, just because I want to make sure it's consistent with all our other documents. OK. It, no, I think that's fine. Uh, it, we are going to have to uh, m make decisions on assumptions next month, and we can roll right. this in. Right, so we'll get back to you by then. I just want to make sure we're not in violation of anything. Okay. But with that said, I mean, can't we give them directions? Because they're, because we might want to say, okay, show us what an eighth of a point difference in discount rate will look like with these other assumption changes, and they come back where we actually prove it the final the next month. So could we do the same thing with that? Like, okay, if we do accept that smoothing process yes. um, change, come back next month so we can look at the final numbers and then approve it then? Yeah, you can certainly do that. I mean, today's meeting is just to pr uh, approve the assumptions, which are the various, you know, price yeah. index, wage index, um, and I, I'm forgetting what the last one is, the discount rate, um, and approving those assumptions. But this is a different question. This is a funding um, policy issue. Whether or not you reset an immunization uh, schedule is not a, an assumption. It, it's a funding mechanism. Okay. So I just want to make sure that yeah. our funding policy doesn't pro prohibit us from doing that. And, and if we, we, we do do it, we should do it as a separate agendized item rather than wrapping it up with the economic assumptions. Yep. So um, I guess to your point, for next month, if we could do like a pros and cons of you know how it would benefit the plan. For example, it looks like, I mean, I understand there would be a huge uptick, but that would mean less capital for the the plan and contributions to invest and then reach funded status. So I, like, we, we can discuss. It's a it's an important issue, and I just want to make sure it's given the due um, respect. Yeah, so I mean, the general impact is going to be slightly higher contributions the next couple of years and slightly lower contributions the couple of years following that. It, it's not um, it's not going to be a, a major shift, but mostly it's to get rid of the the pattern of of going down and then back up. Phil, I have a quick question. It, we can. So is there a reason why you chose five years as opposed to seven or anything a little longer? So uh, five years has been used here for uh, decades. Um, and five years is the most common uh, method to use. Uh, seven it would be certainly an acceptable uh, approach and would provide more uh, stability and certainly something we could look at. Uh, I would certainly, I, I don't think I'd be opposed to changing it to seven. Uh, there are several other systems in California and around the country that do use seven. There are some that go out 
to 10, I'm more reluctant uh, to go that far. It, the, the issue about the period is you want, you want to uh, smooth out the short-term volatility, but you want to follow the long-term trend, and yeah. so you got to kind of balance that, that period. Okay, thanks. But I, I, I didn't quite understand the full Brown Act thing. Can I ask a question on asset smoothing, or are we going to postpone that to next week? Uh, I, I would suggest, well, it's in your material, so yes, you can ask a question about it, but the decision will be made next month because I need to double check our policy. So I, I'm, I'm a little confused. Our current method is not a straight line, it's a, for five years, it's not. No, no so uh, our current method. And we would continue to use this going forward. This is just a one-time uh, adjustment to get it to be smooth. But our current method, so each of these bars here, can I find my cursor, are, uh, are a piece that we are recognizing from a gain or loss. So this is the 2021 gain, and we've already recognized two of the five years, and so there's three even bars for the, the remaining three years on that, that gain. And these dark green bars are the 2022 loss. And so there's four even bars remaining on it because we recognized one last year. So, so what we do is each year it's, it's even, but then we add them up. And so because we have that um, big swing between those years, uh, it swings us from a net uh, recognition in a given year uh, of a gain to a net recognition of a fairly significant loss. Right. And then well, if you look at the 2023 gain, it's a very small gain, but that is that straight line for five years that you're recognizing that gain. It, it's like that smoothing is smoothing process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is yeah. that a fair statement? It, yeah. it is, yeah. and it's not, uh, you know, we, I don't think we've ever come to you to, yeah. to recommend this. It, it's yeah. just that unique situation of those those two offsetting years right next to each other. And, and Bill, we did this about five years, or something similar about five years ago or so, where there was, where the funding was, um, our contribution requirements were gonna go down, but then the following year it jumped up. And I think we just swapped it. So it was a little bit, or over a year or two, and it, it smoothed things out. And the, and the reason we did that was because, you know, one, from the city's perspective, you know, when they forecast their budget, we could provide a smoother, okay, every year is going to be like this versus a seesaw. Um, I mean, is it, is it a methodology sense. issue where we should think about uh, just taking the cumulative number and smoothing it every, every year for five years? Then you won't, you're not going to run into this. Well, it, that would open up. Uh, if we, I'm happy to go through a whole uh, presentation on asset smoothing and the pros and cons of the, the different methods. But uh, before we did something like that, I think we should um, look at the options more, more fully. And this doesn't come up often. I, I mean, I don't remember. This, I, this is the second time, I think, in eight years, I think, well, ever having a discussion. Right. And when you did it about five years ago, it wasn't on the asset smoothing mm -hmm. side. It was on the layers of the amortization. Mm -hmm. So it could have with all your assumptions yeah. and all your liability gains and losses as well. So right. it, was, it was on those layers, not on the smoothing of the assets. Yeah. Piece. Thanks for the correction. Yeah. yeah. This is related to the two years where we had a which is in itself, I, I'm not that old, but I haven't seen that in a long, long time. <laughs> so again, this is a sort of like a one time. Yeah. Usually it will work out. What you're really saying is, and obviously the city may agree or disagree, right, in terms of when they prefer to see the savings versus not the savings, but you just want to make it more stable, which right. is the goal of the smoothing process. So from the board standpoint, more stable uh, is easier to predict and to budget, so that's what you suggested, correct? Yes. Thanks. So um, we can address more questions on that next month, uh, I guess, 
we're suggesting uh, on the economic assumptions essentially no changes uh, with a potential consideration of increasing our wage inflation assumption uh, by 25 basis points. But um, I have Harvey's voice in my head. Um, <laughs> in terms of the criteria that we use to determine whether or not to change the discount rate. Unfortunately, I guess he's on vacation somewhere, but um, I'm sure Maytag will pitch in. But I mean, I, I always get confused when I see things like, oh, um, where is your slide on this? I'm sorry, I'm trying to find, oh, here it is, page 19. Greater, uh, it's okay for the discount rate to be less than expected return because then the greater probability of achieving the return. Um, is that what we should be thinking about or should we just be thinking about what is the most logical discount rate at any point of time? I, I think you should be thinking about both um, because it, it's certainly uh, better to be uh, projecting a conservative number that's not going to be going up. But if you consistently do that, uh, you're actually increasing member contributions because their contributions are tied to the discount rate and not, um, they don't pay, the tier one members do not pay part of the UAL. And so uh, you do want to tie to what the actual expected return is, I think, because of that. But, but having a little bit of a conservative bias in that, especially in a short term period, seems to make sense to me because the members don't want their contributions to go down and then back up either. Fair enough. I'll speak more for the members at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, given the recent volunteer volatility over the last few years that we've seen in the presentation, I would agree that um, making conservative effort to keep it the same right now and see how it's going to play out before we realize that maybe we can bump it up and uh, relieve the members of some of their contributions, this would be the best course of action. And I think in terms of age inflation, if you look at the actual city data, it looks like maybe three and a quarter is maybe a better representative. Um, but again, we can wait a year if, you know, um, given we're not changing the, the discount rate, even though there are reasons for it. I mean, uh, right. Yeah, the same logic you applied last year would yeah. apply this year, I think. Right, and we are recognizing those larger pay increases yeah. in the next two years in the valuation as it is. Oh, so, okay. yeah, it's right. just after, after the, okay. that. Yeah. Is there a statutory requirement for us to review this every year? N no, there's a, an actuarial standard requirement that these assumptions be reasonable every year. Because we, well, I guess on the investment side, we just implemented this sure. SAA not being, yeah, go ahead. So, so, so let me speak to that. So there's no statutory requirement that we revisit our actuarial assumptions every year. However, the, the board does have a constitutional uh, fiduciary duty to make sure that there's actuarial soundness to the plan. And so by looking at these assumptions every year, we, we're checking the pulse on the liabilities and making sure that we are collecting enough money to pay off those long-term liabilities. So there's no statutory requirement that we do it and do it in a certain way, but whatever way you do it, it has to be reasonable with respect to your plan membership in, in, in terms of your plan's attributes. So membership, active versus um, like how mature your plan is, how many active members you have versus not, how much risk you take on. Um, all those attributes that go into the valuation um, can change year after year. Yeah, and I would just emphasize that just because we review them every year does not mean we need to change right. them every year. Yeah, that makes sense. That said, you are recommending the wage inflation to go up to 325 from three. Well, as consider. we said, uh, it was a very soft consider right. because of the same logic the board applied right. last year. Okay. Uh, about the discount rate, I think applies this year. Uh, and so if you do increase it, that will increase the cost. Whereas if next year you decide you do want to increase the discount rate, that's going to reduce costs. 
it, it, it would make sense to do those changes at the same time rather than a year apart. Yes, do it. <laughs> Before they say anything to me. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and we could always, I mean, we could ask them to come back next month to show us what is keeping it the same at 3% versus what 3.25 looks like. And so we could look at the, then the hard numbers, okay, how does that impact our, um, our sponsor, our membership, you know, um, and make evaluation that way. And this would be the great, great time to, you know, provide that guidance to them. Um, so we then next month we can make a, um, a, a recommendation or a vote. And police and fire bargaining units are going to be working on contracts in the next year or two? Or? No, right now uh, we have one more year, July 1, 24 to July 1, 25 for police. And fire, I think yours is up next year. We are up, so sometime next year they'll start negotiating. I mean, the point being that waiting another year makes sense because then you have a better sense uh, as to how is that developing. Yeah. Okay. Right. So let me ask this. Um, just looking at this list right now, the board decisions, um, let's go down to each one. Price inflation, um, is, is there any feedback of changing it or keeping it the same? Let's keep it the same. Keep it the same? All right, what about wage inflation? Would you guys like to see the numbers, what three and three and a quarter looks like? Yes. Okay. And um, amortization schedule, they're recommending no, no changes. You okay with that? I'm okay with that. Um, and discount rate, um, do we want to keep it at that? Do we want to show a second one that looks an eighth of it higher, you know, 6.75? And I'm, what I'm trying to get is in, for them to come, we'll give them some guidelines to come back for next, to we see. Can, the we can look at 6.75. Okay. Remember, for years, we were criticizing only 7.5. Yeah. So yeah. Like I said, no change. Right? Yeah. So, okay. And then, um, council, I'll refer to you this. I mean, can, since we're not making a decision, can we ask them to show us what the numbers look like next month for the assets moving? Sure, you can certainly defer it, but um, you, you could do it two ways. You could either vote today to approve the price inflation and the amortization payment um, increases, which is uh, bullet points one and three, and then have them come back with the rest of it, or you could just defer everything um, for, the, for next month. Okay. It's up to you. So I'm thinking of deferring it all to next month with the caveat that we'll keep the price, price inflation at 2.5, um, wage inflation sounds like show us both see what those numbers look like um, amortization payment increase no change discount rate I wasn't sure I mean, it's, it's it's six one of both yeah, both. yeah. and then asset smoothing <coughs> show the asset smoothing yeah we'll show that and then we'll also have uh, recommended demographic changes and okay. the impacts of those okay yeah. and the goal next month we could vote and approve what we see here, right. and then we either vote and approve the, the other ones or push it to next the following month to make a decision on it. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll try and guess packages yeah. that you might <laughs> consider <laughs> so you could adopt a package. Okay, any other questions yeah, for? Just one, yeah. uh, one comment, uh, which is, I feel like we should, we're not trying to reverse engineer a stability, right? In the sense that if you're if you think wage inflation should increase and the discount rate should be constant and that means we have higher payments that that is the answer as opposed to saying we should only do everything at the same time again this is my harvey voice speaking no no no, no. The, if you think the discount rate should be the same and you think wage inflation should increase then yes we should do it what we're saying is uh the capital market assumptions kind of indicate that you could increase the discount rate, but it's been a sudden change, and so we're reluctant to do that. A okay. And so solely because of that, uh, it, it might make sense to not do the wage inflation until you make a decision okay. on that discount okay. rate. We're on the same page, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. so, any other questions for Ann and Bill? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming we'll down. See you next nice month. I was trying to think. Is this the first time I've, we've seen each other since pre-COVID? Other than in uh, person, I think Zoom? I've seen a few of you in conferences and other.
Yeah. Yes, so. it's definitely the first time I've met a couple of the board members in yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for making the trip, and we'll see you next month. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that takes us through, that's 4C and 4D. So we'll go ahead and go to 4E, discussion and possible action on 2023 Police and Fire Board Self-Assessment Evaluation. And we got, welcome. Good back afternoon. Two months in a row. You're gonna be tired of me soon. <laughs> and it's always fun to follow the actuaries and, and be between lunch. And uh, so, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you all for participating in the survey. I know people get surveyed out a lot, but this stuff's important. Um, board plays an important role in contributing to the fund's success, so um, this is serious stuff. So what I thought I'd do is just quickly run through, very briefly, the high-level points, and then if there's discussion or questions, happy to take them. But at a high level, this is required under the policy to have board members self-assess the performance of the board, et cetera, uh, how to be more effective, and efficient, obviously, is the desired outcome. Uh, so thanks again. We did this survey two years ago, and I'm happy to share comments that I have personally from work with other funds. One of the trustees last month had asked me if there was some sort of evidence or survey data that I could share. Uh, because funds get surveyed out, it's hard to sort of do that, but I'm happy to share other points. If you go to the second page, just very briefly, just not just to be able to uh, foster a bit of a discussion among board committee members, uh, at a high level, everything was positive, you know, at a very high level. Uh, 9.1 out of 10 is a good score, but again, you're self-assessing, so I don't know how hard or easy you are on yourselves. The lowest score was an 8 um, in aggregate, so... I'm going to focus on the things where we were a little lower, where we could think there are opportunities to uh, do better, perhaps. And that, uh, in the top box there, question 20, related to the board's ability to monitor the performance of the organization. So that was a common theme. And so there's obviously opportunities for improvement. One of the trustees said that we can always do better. And one, one trustee specifically said we can be more direct with our communication. And communication is actually very important. That's one of the findings we've, we've experienced is that the better you can focus on the things that matter the most, uh, that's really gonna add value to the fund. And that's particularly important at the board level. So in terms of achievements, um, the incentive compensation system, that was one trustee's comment. I'm just picking a few. Um, and troubleshooting and quickly resolving the retiree tax complication. Everybody, every member mentioned the fact uh, that there was an issue there was a delay in um, recognition of the, or communication of the issue, but I think the committee uh, acted on it and was quite happy that they did as well as they did and engaged uh, in that to get it resolved. In terms of uh, questions 22 to 23, very briefly, um, the issue that came up was, let's figure out the root cause of that tax issue so we can deal with it in a more timely way. Um, and then one trustee had indicated, and we'll certainly look at it at the JPC with regard to the CEO and CIO evaluation, was what happens when the two boards, Federated and Police and Fire, disagree with regards to the things that they have to have some sort of consensus on. So we'll articulate, certainly in that policy, a mechanism, um, and we discussed that with that committee. Um, in terms of behaviors and things that were below expectations, um, there were three observations. Um, uh, one of the things that came out was education as a group. I think COVID kicked in. Obviously, education is important, and doing it as a group, one of the members had indicated that that was uh, something that would be desired. Uh, frequency of meetings was fine. If we jump to page three very briefly, the one thing under the right column, there's a little table there. One of the things that I noticed was that uh, there were you know, three trustees on the right-hand side um, made the point um, where they were neutral. They weren't strongly positive or positive about this, these attributes, but it was really about monitoring stakeholder communications, member services, and the organization as a whole. And uh, there was a mention about a dashboard um, that may exist, one board member had said. I'm not sure that it was being leveraged fully, so I'm not sure of the, of the nature of that dashboard, but... I would share the, the notion that as a committee, as a board member, your role is to um, 
oversee things and you can't really do that without good communication and you know focusing on dashboard reporting exception reporting that's that's sort of a a very desirable uh, thing to have um, in terms of HR there were two trustees felt that there was um, uh, we weren't as engaged effectively in succession planning um, and I guess in terms of frequency everything was 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 um, was reasonably fine in terms of frequency of meetings. A couple of trustees felt things were a little too long, too, too short, but nothing huge. Um, so that was really just at a high level just to plant the seed and just to, to relay back what I heard from individual members. Um, and I'll open it up for any questions and comments. Again, just with the, with the goal to, we always wanna be more effective in how we oversee management and efficient in the process. And that's it's never easy when you've got a bunch of people with different perspectives, but always wanting to do the right thing. I do ha just have a brief question. Yeah. So I'm looking at the agenda item here and asks for a discussion and possible action. Is there a recommendation or action that is coming out of your evaluation that you're asking the board to, to take? Um, the one thing I would, I, I, the only action item I would suggest the board consider is one of the trustees had suggested education was, was something that we hadn't done as a committee and I think COVID was probably one of the reasons for that. Um, if there's anything I can do to help on that front, uh, we do send the Cortex report, with, which gives education opportunities. Uh, I ha we have participated in things. If, we c if there's anything Cortex can do, we're happy to help facilitate that. But I think board education is important. It's this movement from asking the right questions, uh, being unaware, getting better answers to those questions, and then actioning those things. So if, if I had one um, common theme I share with boards, in the pension fund industry, it's looking back at 30 years of experience having worked at two very big funds. The, the challenges never change. It's always focus, process, and resources. And two of the trustees that I'm looking at were at the calipers uh, session where, where I led co-led one of the governance topics. And they'll hear me say the same thing five years ago, five, five years from now if I'm um, fortunate enough to be at calipers again. Focus on the things that matter the most. Be risk conscious as the board. Focus on the risks that matter the most, the long horizon asset allocation stuff. Active management's important, but don't focus on that until you've got the liabilities understood and managed well. Um, and if you can just constant re constantly reinforce that and have discussions fo focused on that, that, that would be my recommendation. Just make sure you do the things you can to be focused on those important things. And education's part of that. And maybe what we could do is we could maybe ask staff to put out a survey to all the trustees soliciting what type of training, you know, they would like to receive and we could try and work that in over the next year or something like that, um, you know, and, and attack it that way um, or just gather feedback from and then we could compile it. Any other questions for Walter? No, another good thing for the chair is have a retreat where we can just sit down and talk to each other for the whole time about yeah. whatever we had and whatever we can with violating the Brown Act. Yeah. And we yeah. haven't done it, you know, because yeah. of many, many reasons. And we could do some of that training, you know, at the offsite if we uh, pick that back up again. Yeah, you know, um, I know a number of other public pension funds have strategic planning and oftentimes they'll use that as an educational bit to yeah. go through and also advise on strategic planning issues, for example, like how to deal with liquidity. Um, in a plan where, where, where that's an issue. Yeah. Um, those, are, those are things that we can, you know, strategic yeah. issues and we can have education on it. And I think we, a lot of the board members weren't here at the time, but pre-COVID, we were doing that annually. We would have an off-site full day um, and we were talking about a variety of different things. And so maybe that's something that we could pick back up again um, and address maybe the bigger training issues or not training opportunities, not issues. That would be good. So. Since that, you know, I'm probably the nearest member here. <laughs> also, you know, just to digest this and maybe get some feedback from everybody else as to what they think that we could do better mm -hmm. from this report, that would be useful. Okay. Is that, I mean, since you spoke to everybody um, on a one-on-one -on -one, um, interview, is that a list that you could put together of, um, of what Dave was just talking about, you know, of what we could do better, I guess? What's the best way to phrase it? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was uh, saying. I mean, since you have that info, if you if you yeah, have that information, yeah, we could easily 
I could easily throw up a straw man and say, do we all agree? You know, happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Things we can work on. Yeah. Because what I tried to focus on here was not all the good things we were doing. Like we all work together well. Yeah. We're all, respectful but yeah come up yeah. with this okay. action checklist of things to consider yeah and so if you if you could sure. do that that'll be sure. great and then maybe if staff could just put some type of survey out to all the trustees asking what kind of training opportunities yeah i, I took no i mean to make sure we do that um can i ask a question absolutely um i know this is a self-assessment which yes. is understood is self-assessment from the board members I just wonder uh, to what extent would be helpful when the board do a self-assessment to hear from the security staff that the board work with, right? Because we have thoughts about yes. things that I think I recognize this is a fail assessment and asking the security staff takes it away from being just self-assessment. <laughs> um, but it will be interesting to to compare and contrast how the board view themselves <laughs> versus things that their executive staff will be willing to comment on things that they believe the board can consider to have a perhaps a better execution uh, to be more effective that's all that's what you're saying that you change that it's just set up for the future yeah I, I personally would like to hear something like that. I, I, it increases uh, communication between the executive staff and the board, and I think that's important. Yeah. Be a good I conversation totally starter. Because obviously we all feel we are doing great. <laughs> okay. okay. Happy to help facilitate that. I'm just trying to think. I can think offline of ways to do that to make it effective and meaningful to everybody. I'm trying to figure out a way to structure, but I'm happy to think of something so that when it comes back, it's actionable. Like, it's very clear that... This is what we heard, yeah. and make it. You know, we don't want to point. You know, Roberto says this, and <laughs> Prabhu says right. that. You make sure you use tell on the Prabhu's side. We'll name. Prabhu. Prabhu <laughs> said it all. He said it all. <laughs> I mean, can yeah. they just take the same survey? Sh happy to do that. Question is, in terms of scope, who would we send it to? Because we could ask everybody, or uh, I look Roberto for guys. And like in terms of staff. Oh. Uh, I would say the, the executive staff, so for example, if you're dealing with the board, I would say Barbara, Prabhu, and I. Sure. And I, for example, Prabhu may want to then sit down with his staff and, and sure. seek input from the investment yep. officers, but I think, yeah, the, the, the key personnel that deals with the staff, I will probably ask uh, my administrative staff, right, because they do work with trustees considerably, yep. so. Okay. That's fantastic. I like Great. that idea. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, thank you. It's great to see you, everybody. So we'll defer this action when he comes back to give his recommendations? Yes, please. Okay. Yes, thanks. All right, that was, what, 4E. So now to 4F. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Cortex provides some services to both of the boards. Um, and this is around the time of the year that we usually come back um, to request uh, approval to negotiate an amendment to the current contract. Uh, I just want to point out that this year, the number that you see, the not to exceed 50,000, is a little higher than usual. And that's because uh, after your last joint audit committee, uh, the audit committee requested that we reach out to Cortex for their availability and willingness to work with us on a specific project that came out of the um, joint audit committee, which I believe you're going to hear about it uh, later this, after this afternoon from the audit committee. So that number uh, includes costs associated with that kind of work. Um, Please know that this is not to exceed amount. The amount that I was given by Cortex was lower, so I wanted to make it clear the fact that you approve and not to exceed 50,000 is something that we will um, spend the whole 50,000. But I wanted to make sure that we have some flexibility because we don't know how that project is going to develop and whether there's going to be further work to be completed. So I wanted to have some buffers some flexibility. If you do approve this, again, this is 50,000 per plan, 
then I would then work with uh, council to uh, execute to draft uh, an amendment so that it could be uh, then signed off. But that's just wanted to provide that kind of background. And this will be again not only for the project that the joint audit committee is recommending, but for the regular services that they provide to your board on the annual basis. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if Cortez, have, do you have any comments uh, to that? No. Okay. Very well. Thanks. All right. Looks like I got a. I got a motion. Um, Speed this process up. Then I make a motion. <laughs> motion by Santos. Second. Second by Eshwar. <laughs> Wait, uh, sorry. Yes. Any comments? Yeah. So, I thought it was already within their mandate to do to do the um, main tags for you for Cortex to do the audit committee recommendation. So uh, this is just to extend the uh, term of their current agreement and their total amount. The other item that's under um, section 272 is to expand their services to include the procurement and contracting <coughs> issues. So we're adding to their scope of services under um, item the audit committee item 72E. Um, my understanding from Roberto's comments for item 4F is that we are extending the term of their current agreement and then adding money. And then later on when we get to the audit committee section of the, the meeting, we'll expand the scope to include that. Okay, so it's just coincidence that they both came yes. on the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. We purposely added money to the contract to allow for the work that the audit committee is requesting. Okay. Yes. And, and do we, is, there, is it a material increase or? Uh, no, it's not material. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to it. I think uh, I, the usual number uh, on the annual basis is 25,000 without those services. Thir 30. 30. And yeah, that's a maximum. That's and, right. And we build by the hour, of course. Yes. And then um, we, we proposed, you know, as, as Roberto had mentioned, um, the, you know, the minimum would be, depends on implementation. If you want more services to say, you know, here's a, p easy to write a policy that reflects certain standards and best practices or whatever balance you want. Happy to write the policies. If there's follow on work that requires, okay, we need some implementation regarding the policies. That's where, happy to help if you choose to okay. engage us. So, so that's so why there's a bit of a cushion. So it's 30K times two, right? For each plan? Yes. Yeah, so But as the part pro policies are gonna be just one for both plans. It's for the, for the department. Uh, correct. Okay. Correct. Clarify that. Yeah. yeah. No, I and I added to the number that he provided. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted the buffer yeah. purposely. Again, that's why I made the point. We don't ha do not have to spend the whole cost. Yeah. But I didn't want to have to come back to the board in the event that the project was such that required a little more time. Makes that, sense. That was it. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, uh, Dick. Uh, don't yeah, be sorry. No, slow it down. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so we got a, we got a motion by Santos, second by Eshwar. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, so 4F four, four passes. On to 4G. Hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm here to present the Granicus memo. Uh, the Granicus agenda management systems is the I interrupt. This is Shilpi Devedi. She's our department IT manager. I'm not sure. This is her first time presenting to the board. Oh, so yeah, nice to, to the meet you. Police Wanted and fire board, board, yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you. So I'm here to seek approval for the Granicus memo. Uh, the Granicus agenda management software streamlines the process of creating, managing, and sharing the meeting agendas. It enables staff to create items and assign them to the appropriate agenda. And it also integrates the agenda data with iLegistar, which all of you use on your iPad. The proposed Fifth Amendment would extend the contract term by an additional year until October 31st, 2024, for an annual cost of 8,000, approximately $8,000. And that, 8, and that is cost split. is split between the two plans. So it's divided be by so 4,000 each. Okay. That's right. We have a motion for, for one reason. I never had that lowest amount in my life. So <laughs> 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 That's lunch money right now. Uh, all right, got a, got a motion by Santos. I'll second that. <laughs> second by Quan. Any other questions or discussions? Public. All right, uh, 
Uh, uh, motion to approve. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Great job on your first. <laughs> 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 All right, so that moves on moves us on to retirement. Uh, looks like we got four retirement. We got Andrew T. Brown, police officer, uh, police department effective October 20th, 2023, with 25.01 years of service. <coughs> Milan uh, Hernser, police officer, police department effective November 10th, 2023, with 27.18 years of service. Victor Perez, police officer, police department effective October 27th, 2023, with 25.01 years of service. And Timothy uh, J. Takash, uh, police officer, police department effective October 27th, 2023, with 25.01 years of service. And I'm going to do deferred, and then we'll, we'll do a vote. Um, and with, at 5.2, deferred vested, we've got uh, um, Leanne M. Uh, McMahon, uh, police officer, police department effective October 28th, 2023, with 26.98 years of service with reciprocity. Motion to approve. Before it. So we got to take two separate motions. Oh, we do? Yeah. Okay, apologize. But you read it for the record. So. He was trying. He was I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, for the service retirements, um, take a motion for? Motion to approve. Motion approved by Santos. Second. Second by uh, Wilson. There's no. Any comments? No. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, and we'll take 5.2 deferred. Uh, take a motion. Motion to approve. Motion by Santos. Second. Second by Wilson. Any comments? Uh, uh, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, anybody would like to make any comments uh, for these? Mr. Mr. Wilson. Considering they're all police. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just wish them the best in retirement. Two of them are from my academy. Uh, three of them are junior me, so I don't know what I'm doing wrong by still being active. But uh, wish them the best in retirement, and I'll join you soon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks for the service. Yeah, thank you for the service. Wonderful. All right, so we'll move on to um, death and survivorship notifications. A uh, notification of the death of Roy, Roy Isle, fire captain, retired, fire, or retired March 5th, 1986, died September 11th, 2023. No survivorship benefits. Notification of the death of Luis G. Noricio, a police officer, retired December 1st, 1974, died August 20th, uh, 2023. No survivorship benefits. Uh, notification of the death of Henry A. Wheeler, fire engineer, retired January 29th, 1984, died August 7th, 2023. Survivorship benefits goes, goes to Yvonne Wheeler, spouse. At this moment, we'll take a moment of silence. Thank you. Anybody have any um, comments? Hey, thanks for the service and best of your families. Yeah, condolences to the family. Um, sorry, sorry for your loss. I'd like to just point out that uh, Mr. Noricio made it f almost 50 years oh. in retirement. Wow. Congratulations and a nice long life. Thank you. All right, we'll go to committees, um, investment committee. Um, Yes, so he did, he'd have, he did have a meeting a month ago, right after uh, the board <coughs> meeting. Uh, we discussed the policy statement that we discussed again here today and approved. Um, we looked at manager decisions for the first half of the year, and we discussed the real estate program. All right, thank you. And we'll go ahead and receive the minutes uh, from the Police and Fire Investment Committee for <laughs> April 27, 2023. Uh, audit committee. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess the we uh, had a meeting on September 21st, but uh, should we just receive and file the May 18th minutes first? Yeah, we'll go ahead and yeah, we'll go ahead and receive um, receive and file the May 18th uh, minutes. Okay, uh, I mean, I, I, the main update is around uh, item C, which is uh, the audit committee met in September and uh, ex accepted management's response to the uh, audit and procurement and contract oversight report from uh, internal audit. Uh, the the response is attached, but I do think there was a verbal amendment to number three, Barbara. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that because that's not reflected in the in this document. Yeah, and I can bring that forth to the next board meeting if you would like. 
I'm with sorry? the amendments included? Uh, I thought this was where the, the there was uh, you, you made a some comment. wording changes, yeah, yeah, um, to take out um, uh, like all departments or like all city departments that was to be removed, and there was a clarification on the um, equipment um, that uh, caused the delay. Yeah, yeah, on the laptops, right? Yeah. Um, so the main the main um, item here was uh, which sort of feeds into. For uh, seven point two e was um, relating to item number four, uh, the finding number four, which is we need a much more comprehensive policy that addresses procurement, um, which uh, which is why we want to hire Cortex. I know we'll get to four e, but that was finding number four, which is sort of overarching across all the, uh, the other some of the other findings, uh, to have a sp or a specific policy which will uh, clearly articulate what which um, vendors we follow uh, for the city policies, which is when, which vendors we, d we have ORS-specific policies. And I think uh, uh, that that was sort of the gist of that audit. Um, I would say that after the audit committee meeting, we did receive communication uh, from, from, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, articulate some disagreement with management's explanations. Uh, it came to all audit committee members, and we will uh, discuss that in the next audit committee meeting. On reading that, we, we still think uh, the board should accept management's response at this time, and if there are changes that the audit committee proposes, we will come back uh, with that. Does that, any questions? Uh, just a, a comment. You know, uh, around a long time, when you work with audits, it could be as boring and very frustrating but I really appreciate Sunita today, today when something happens to, get, to make sure we got clarification and people understand what's going on because the plan comes first. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, um, Sunita, on here on the agenda says possible action. Is there any action that we need to take, the board? Yes, I think it, we, we are rec the audit committee unanimously approved the <laughs> management's response to okay. the internal audit report uh, with the amendments that Barbara spoke about. Um, and we are recommending that the board accept management's response so we can file. Uh, am I saying this right, Maytag? To file the. Well, the we would accept their recommendations and then implement them. So yeah. everything, okay. if you see in column um, three of the attachment, it would be the recommendations in response to the findings. Yeah. Okay. Any questions for Sunita on, on this one item? If not, I'll take a motion to approve the recommendation. So moved. Motion approved by Santos. Second. Second by Lee. Any public comments? All right. Uh, motion approved. Aye. Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So 72C. Um, on, and we'll go ahead and receive and file um, the memorandum uh, from City Auditor entitled Internal uh, Control Risk Regarding the City, or sorry, the Office of Retirement Services, dated May 11, 2023. And that brings us to E. Yeah. So this is, uh, I, I sort of talked about it in, in C. We're recommending to the board to engage Cortex to, to assist in remediating item number four, which is writing a policy. Uh, we recommend also that they collaborate with uh, Harvey and Maytag around writing that policy. Harvey's already made a, uh, had provided, a, or Harvey and Maytag have already provided a draw, uh, sample from OCRS. So we, we recommend to the board that we hire Cortex, but we also recommend that this be done uh, as soon as possible. Well, I would support that. We just gave him $50,000. <laughs> well, we gave uh, Roberto authority to give them. <laughs> yeah. So we just need uh, action by the board to, uh, if, if the board is in agreement. Okay. And that's the motion. And that's the okay. So a motion by uh, Santos. Um, to to engage Cortex in conducting the ORS policy and procedure contract issues. Um, second? We'll second that. Uh, second by Quan. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, Sunita. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, before we go to 7.3, um, and I'll defer to the <coughs> chair of the audit committee. <coughs> Excuse me, but I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, on item 7.2, the, the 
city auditor actually came before the joint audit committee <coughs> and, and spoke about their process uh, regarding this work and I wanted to make sure that it's understood. He, his office is actually conduct, conducting an audit <coughs> of the Office of Retirement Services and they are scheduled to present their finding, um, which generally speaking their finding is, and I'm just paraphrasing, there is a gap between some of the controls and the policies in the ORS versus the city and it needs to be decided, are we going to do and sort of follow the city requirements or are we going to prepare our own? And um, We are um, responding that <coughs> we are uh, embarking in a process approved by the boards to work with the third party vendor to produce uh, policies and procedures um, that are uh, effective and uh, strong in and controls. He is presenting his findings at the City Council October 24th. Um, I let them know I would try to attend. I am not in San Jose at that time, so if I attend, it will be remotely. But it just so happened that it's my week birthday, which falls the same week every year. And um, I, my wife have actually is my 60th, so she had made arrangements and I'm not actually positive that I will be able to attend him only. So if I'm not, obviously Barbara will be extremely excited to, uh, to attend the city council meeting, um, which she will, no matter what, whether I attend him only or not, but I just wanted to basically let you know that was the case. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for the reminder, uh, Roberto. I think it was interesting, um, city auditor came and he um, also, described the scope of his uh, function <coughs> as reporting directly to the city council uh, and not to the city manager. He was very specific in saying that, which I thought uh, was an interesting, um, you know, underlined um, sort of uh, chain of command. Um, I, uh, the complexity was he said that he couldn't present or give us an early read into the findings before, before the council would see it, that it would, he, that wasn't under his jurisdiction. Yeah, so I, if I recall correctly, the, the audit report is going to be published on October 14th. I, I, is, do I have that right? I think it was around the, I think it was the 14th, now it's either the 12th or the 13th, one of those two days. Okay, yes. so when uh, the city auditor did, I think, um, if memory serves me correctly, so Sunita or uh, Dave, <laughs> correct me if I misremember, but he said that he anticipates that the report will be published around October 13th or 14th, and then once it's published, he's open to speak to any of the trustees individually about um, his audit findings. So he wanted to extend that as well. And yeah, Sunita, wasn't he gonna present at the Joint Audit Committee on the 19th as well? Uh, on the 21st, 19th? 19th. Sorry, 19th. Yeah. It's my dad's birthday, so I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, he will be presenting to potentially us, the audit committee, first before city council? No. Because you said he was going to release it on the 14th. Right. Yeah, okay. release it publicly, the, the report. The si city council's on the 24th. Yeah, because of sunshine requirements. Uh, yeah. To but then we're, we're the 19th? Isn't, I thought you said the audit committee. Yeah, it, it is. It I is the 19th, but said. he will not present to the committee before okay. the city council. Okay. He made so it'll be the following the committee. Yeah, then. I don't think he can come to the audit. Yeah. Committee. Yes. Okay. That's right. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. And I think the um, complexity is he is uh, he's going to have findings about ORS, but it's going to go yeah. to uh, and the city and public before it comes to us. Yeah, and f correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think I overheard that the volume of work that the city council asked his team to do is quite large that so they're doing in tranches. Yes. So so this report that's being released on the 14th is just phase one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Thank you for that clarification, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, so on to governance. Uh, we have um, the chair is not, not here, but um, we have been in discussions with, uh, with Cortez actually and uh, trying to um, schedule a meeting um, for the governance committee. It, it will probably be in the next couple of months, but we, we haven't really pinned down a, a day yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, disability. October 10th meeting was canceled for whatever reason. The last time we had one, September, looks like 15th, and uh, 
Trustee Wilson stepped in to pinch it, which we really appreciate. The next meeting will be November 6th, and then you have our minutes there. All right, thank you. I will go ahead and um, receive and file the minutes from yes. August 7th, 2023. Uh, JPC. I have no meeting, but uh, I'd like to thank uh, our member and acting chair, Andrew, for presenting at the city council on our behalf yeah. and salary proposal. And just to carry on what um, uh, council member Foley was saying, we did, did present on last week um, they chose to um, look further into the item and push it out 90 days. So somewhere in December, January, we'll go back in front of city council in regards to um, salary ranges for um, our investment staff, CEO and CIO. Okay. And you're trying to coordinate a meeting, I don't know, maybe in October. Uh, so, yeah, yeah um, we, we, be try, we try for, yeah. For, the, yeah, for September, but we will we'll talk to staff and uh, make sure that we serve the members again so okay. soon when they're available. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any uh, proposed agenda items? Well, there's a comment. I think today when everybody pinch hit when we have a vacancy or someone's on vacation and how we come together and really explore potential investigations and promote this uh, plan, I think is really commendable. Thank you for the comment. Any other, any other comments or agenda items? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you, staff, for organizing all this and doing all the hard work. And thank you for pinching as a chair. And you know, you did a terrific job. We makes it really hard not to reelect you as chair in the future, <laughs> Trustee Cardenia. Not with when it ends at one fifteen. <laughs> <laughs>